Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to tackle a difficult question head on. And I am the one who's going to do it because you know me by now as the Fearless Family Court Vlogger. The question for debate today is, should you, particularly as a father, leave the family home before making an application to the family court and securing an order for child arrangements? I'm going to debate the pros and cons, and at the end, I will sum up my personal thoughts. But before I do, I simply must, yes, I must, run my excellent introduction. I am Philip KJ, retired police chief inspector and director of the Mackenzie Friend UK network. I have been a Mackenzie Friend layperson for over a decade, and in all my vlogs, my views and opinions are entirely my own. I don't give legal advice because you don't need sick in the head family lawyers who all too often stir the pot of acrimony for their own financial gain, do thousands of pounds of totally unnecessary work, leave people in crippling financial debt and have absolutely no professional duty of care to any child. How disgraceful is that? Now, I hope that you spotted the shield of light and not hate in the introduction and thumbnail, that's because this is part of the campaign of how to take a stand against spurious allegations of hate in the family court. I am not talking about what I see as the 20% of cases where there is real and abhorrent domestic abuse that requires safeguarding. I am talking about the vast majority of cases that I see involving mudslinging bollocks frequently made by resident parents to manipulate them many family court judges from planet stupid to restrict minimize reduce and deny child contact with the non-resident parent who are mostly fathers so should you leave the family home if you have children once the relationship has come to a terminal and often undignified end well, that debate starts with a question that I am asked all the time. Is the family court biased against fathers when it comes to child arrangements? Let me answer that first. There is a big problem with that question. You see, if I say yes, I believe so, then all the woke, man-hating, bleeding-heart liberals will simply say, prove it, Phil. And of course I can't. I don't think that it is something that you can actually scientifically investigate and demonstrate with any level of statistical significance. The problem is how do you test it? What are the criteria? What are the variables? How do you keep them all constant with a control sample? I don't think it's possible. So, in my mind, it's the wrong question to ask and the wrong approach to take when challenging the family court. So, the question needs changing. The issue needs to be looked at differently. And I believe that the correct question is this. Can the family court be manipulated by resident parents with spurious allegations of domestic abuse and coercive control to minimise, reduce, restrict and deny contact with the non-resident parent. Now, I can with absolute confidence answer that question with a resounding yes. It's so easy to manipulate the family court that even I could do it. And the important point that makes my argument credible is that not only can I do it, but I can actually demonstrate exactly how it is being done in a step-by-step -step guide, breaking down the family court system and processes into its component parts and showing how at each stage it can be manipulated. I have no doubt that there are potentially thousands of you who can testify as to being on the receiving end of such manipulation. I have even given you the opportunity to decide for yourselves because I have presented that very argument in my vlog, 
perhaps the most important family court vlog you will ever see called Why the Family Court is so terrifying, the blueprint of hate. If you haven't seen it, please take a pause here, watch it and then come back. You can make your own minds up, but I'm pretty sure that you will be shocked at what I expose in that vlog. From my observations and experience, it is an irrebuttable truth that the family court can be manipulated by resident parents motivated by spite, revenge, hate, hurt feelings, unfettered emotions and irrational anxieties to willfully weaponize the children and the family court against the non-resident parent. But what's the relevance of that when it comes to the family home? Well, it's highly relevant because as the father, the second you leave the family home after separation, then you become that non-resident parent and you are then at the total mercy of your ex when it comes to any contact that you may have with your children from that point on. You never know when it may be the last time that you get to hug, cuddle, kiss your children and to tell them that you love them for months and months on end. By applying some rational logic to that potential reality, then leaving the family home after the relationship ends may be a big mistake. But that has to be weighed up against a very real counter-argument that has significant merit. That staying will create a toxic environment in the home which is harmful to the children. Let's take a few moments to discuss that. Yes, it very well might create a harmful environment, but it doesn't have to. It frustrates me when there exists a presumption that only fathers create toxic environments. Firstly, it is the responsibility of both parents to recognise that a toxic environment is harmful to the children and that they must both take responsibility for managing and preventing it. Secondly, if both parents have legal rights to the residence, why is there a social expectation that the father has to leave and to leave straight away? There is no legal basis to support such an expectation. Now, I have no doubt at this point that members of the false victimhood and man-hating sisterhood will be shouting at their screens ranting about toxic masculinity. Well, what about toxic femininity? Blimey, that can be truly spiteful, savage and brutal. Perhaps it's about time Kafkas and the family court started to recognise that. So, it is the responsibility for both parents to set the boundaries and to behave. But the significant dilemma which often faces fathers is weighing up the potential for an increasingly toxic and harmful environment versus the very real possibility that if they step foot outside the front door to relocate, they may not see their children again for perhaps months and months on end, even in many cases well over a year, as a result of nothing more than spurious allegations based on hate and the weaponizing and manipulation of the children and the family court against them. Given that leaving the family residence may very well mean not only giving up the keys to the home, but also the keys to your children, does it not make logical sense to remain in the property until child arrangements have been formally resolved, either with a consent order perhaps following mediation, or a final order following an application to the family court. There are potentially some clear advantages to remaining in the family home. That both parents are perhaps more likely to resolve matters more quickly via mediation perhaps, and with a consent order rather than enduring living together 
for the next 12 months whilst fighting it out in the family court. Mudslinging allegations around parenting is less likely because both parents can demonstrate that their parenting is already good enough. And spurious allegations around domestic abuse becomes less relevant because both parents are maintaining child contact. Of course, where there are issues around domestic abuse and behaviour, then there is always the option of protective measures such as non-molestation orders and occupation orders. These provide a safeguarding safety net. There is also one other very interesting consideration. Could remaining in the family residence increase the likelihood of achieving 50-50 shared care? I can't say with any certainty that it does, but perhaps hypothetically it could, because the transition would be seen as more seamless rather than the father leaving spending months potentially without contact and then seeking 50-50 shared care, which becomes increasingly less likely due to the acrimony and the status quo against it having been set. Now, as an important reminder, I am only raising a debate for discussion. I'm not telling you what to do. Only you can make decisions as to what may be right for you given your own individual circumstances and what you may believe to be in the best interest of your children. Of course, your ex may have very different opinions as to what is in the best interest of the children. And ultimately, if you can't agree or compromise, then the broken, inept, incompetent and incomprehensible family court will decide for you. Good luck with that. So, one more question to explore. Why do so many fathers at the first opportunity after a relationship breaks down, move out? Clearly the vast majority do. Well, I have asked this question to literally hundreds of dads seeking help through the McKenzie Friend UK network. And this is what I get a sense of in terms of common replies. Let's start with the obvious. Some may have found a new potential partner and want to move in with them. It's not my place to judge. Secondly, dads fear conflict if they remain, that they will be stitched up with false allegations and even face arrest, and hence decide to get out because they have too much to risk professionally and personally. Thirdly, it's often just an emotional or knee-jerk reaction. They're put under so much pressure that they just go off and stay with friends and relatives until finding other accommodation. Frequently, it hasn't been thought through. They are, they are just going with the flow and the standard expectation. But there is another reason that seems to repeat itself over and over again. That reason is down to both naivety and ignorance. Fathers say to me that they believe that if they moved out and things went south in terms of child arrangements and contact and mediation did not work out, that the family court with fairness and justice would quickly step in to protect their rights to see their children. How wrong can they be? You see, in our legal system, a parent has no right to have contact with their children. Parental responsibility, which are your legal parental rights, excludes the right to see your children. Take a look at the Government and Judiciary website. Parental responsibility for separated parents. If you have parental responsibility for a child, but you do not live with them, it does not mean you have a right to spend time with your children. However, the other parent must include you when making important decisions about their lives. 
You do not always need to get the consent of the other parent for routine decisions, even if they also have parental responsibility. If it's a major decision, for example, one of you wants to move abroad with your children, both parents with responsibility must agree in writing. Now, that's a shocker, isn't it? I suspect that many of you didn't see that coming. You see, parental responsibility gives parents certain legal rights and responsibilities, but does not automatically include a right to contact. There is a presumption that it is in the best interest of a child to spend time with both parents. But, and this is important to understand, only if it is safe to do so. So, that's where the problems often begin. The father leaves the home, their ex becomes the resident parent and quickly runs off to their all too often sick in the head family lawyer. Spurious allegations are made citing a risk to the children and contact is then denied. At which point the father can now quite likely kiss goodbye to seeing the children again for months and months on end as the family court is now easily tied up in knots over the question of safety and harm, however spurious those allegations may be. So, it's time for my final thoughts. The question as to whether it is best to stay or go is one that only you as individuals can decide. However, what I suggest is important is that any decision is a carefully considered and well-informed decision based on as many of the influencing factors as possible. Such a decision is perhaps best made based on the head and not the heart and always have a plan B if it doesn't work out. However, what I do find to be really troubling is this. When fathers do take a decision to leave the family residence, to reduce conflict for the best interests of the children, leaving all the control with the mothers, why does the family court and judges from Planet Stupid then appear to further empower and support these mothers who then throw their ex under the family court bus with often devastating long-term consequences. Why on earth do we have to tolerate and suffer such a third-rate, third-world, broken, draconian, incomprehensible family court system that itself can be manipulated to become part of the destruction of relationships and the significant harm to the very children that it claims to protect. Well, these are issues that I will continue to raise and examine in my future vlogs. It really is a very sick system that quite frankly needs putting down. Well, I'm going to conclude there, but I suspect that this topic is going to create much debate and won't be going away anytime soon. So please contact me today for all of your family court solutions based needs at contactphil.co.uk where I can even offer you a personal one-to-one -one case review to discuss your situation. Until next time, stay strong.